Well, we're going to do something a little different today, even though it is Easter. Um, I'm taking us back into the tomb, and we're going to see a lot of pictures from Jacques Tissot today, our famous 19th century, century watercolor painter who went to Israel and went to the spots where things took place, imagined the characters in the narrative there, and then drew the picture of the place with the characters put in. So that's what you'll see today. <clears throat> Here we're coming back to the tomb, because uh, if you go to the Holy Sepulchral tomb in Jerusalem, where they say Jesus was buried, it looks just like this on the inside. There's a little square door in the background you come through. you got to stoop to just about this high to get in through it. And then there's a shelf right there, which now has a whole ton of candles all over it and stuff like that. But the, the whole, the, 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 that whole area, that Holy Sepulchre, um, it looks like a big church and stuff like that. And in the center of it, it has this, it has this tomb. There's a, there's a big piece of rock, just a big piece of rock in the middle that over the years has been cut down so it'll fit inside of a building. But it's still, it's still the same rock that was part of the hillside. And, uh, and, and traditionally, that's where Jesus was laid to rest. And then, you know, I tend to believe it's true. When you see the church that's over it, you say, nah, this can't be the place. But when you go and actually see this rock that's cut out of the hillside that has since been covered by a dome in a church, you realize, yeah, this might have been it. Anyway, we're going to the tomb. And when they buried Jesus, so we're going back a couple days in the narrative from Easter morning, because I want to show you something that we almost always overlook. As we go back into the tomb, they buried Jesus, they prepared his body for burial, they wrapped the clothing, clothing around it, right, and then laid it on a shelf. And then typically from that point on, they would mourn for a while, uh, but that body would stay wrapped in that clothing with the spices for quite some time. And then about a year later, plus or minus, they would uh, they'd go back and they'd take the bones that were there, and they put them together and put them in a small box that looks like a footlocker made out of limestone. And they put the bones in a bone box. That's what they, Can you imagine a year after your loved one dies going in and just taking the bones that are left over and putting them in a box? But that, that was it. So here they are putting Jesus' body there on the left, wrapped up in the clothing. And, uh, and at this point in the narrative, everybody who was a follower of Jesus is in shock, in absolute shock. I mean, he had warned them many times that I'm, we're going into Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me. They're going to beat me up. They're going to kill me. I mean, he told them all this. And then he also said, on the third day, I'll rise again. And not only his followers got the message, but his detractors did as well. However, when he dies, it feels like the end of a movement. If this is the Messiah, how come has no one ever talked about in the Old Testament that he had to die? This is just not part of the plan. So when they lay Jesus to rest right here and they wrap his body up, it seems like the end of the entire movement that had been gaining momentum for like three years. I mean, it had just been rising until we came in on Palm Sunday last week and everybody was pro-Jesus in Jerusalem except for the Pharisees. I mean, it was a big, big deal. And yet, boom, just like that, it's over. It's over. Well, what we're going to look at today as we're waiting for the resurrection of Jesus, they see, I'm telling you, we're going back a couple of days. I want to talk about this. I want to talk about the resurrection that happened before the resurrection. It's not in my Bible, Jim. Oh, well, it is in your Bible. Uh, what am I talking about? Okay, let's go back to the crucifixion scene. You go up on the hill here. Great chaos ensuing as all these people are around. And the chaos isn't just because they're crucifying three people on the hill. The chaos is because there's so much detractors up there that are yelling things at Jesus. They're not yelling things at the other two criminals next to them. They're yelling things at Jesus because, I mean, it's just chaos. And so it says right here in Luke 23, 43, while they're up on the cross there, Jesus said to the thief, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the resurrection before the resurrection. There's life actually before Jesus rises from the tomb. So this is what I want to look at this day, this statement right here, and kind of dwell on this a little bit more. It's a very, it's a very odd thing. But in reality, what Jesus is telling the thief on the cross is that even before Jesus himself was going to rise from the dead in a couple days, You'll see me tomorrow in paradise. So let's look at that because it raises a ton of great questions. Okay, let's go back in the story. This is where Jesus is being condemned. This is Tissot's picture of what it looks like. Big old courtyard in that, in that central kind of semicircle on the left and white there. That's where all the big toots in town, including Pilate at the center, is sort of giving his final dictate about the, the condemnation of Jesus, as well as the two crooks. And uh, what Tissot does right here, this is, this is totally imagination. He just kind of figures this is what it looked like. 
but he also wants to get a close-up view of what's going on right there. So the, I'll put a little yellow, uh, see this little yellow arrow right there? If you could put yourself there and then draw a picture looking back toward Jesus and the guys on the podium, it would look like this. Ah. And there Luke says two, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. So there's the, the big toots on the stage up there, religious, as well as one, uh, Pilate's the guy in white right there who's, who's reading the thing. Uh, Tiso imagines that the two other criminals just had the crossbars of their crosses, but Jesus had his entire cross, so they're getting ready to put the entire cross on his back. A lot of this is speculation, but in general, this is kind of what happened. <clears throat> John goes on in 1916. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified, talking about Pilate. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the Place of the Skull, which is in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. So third hour in first century time is three hours after sunrise. If sunrise is at 6 a.m., then this is at... Wow. You can do math even after eating a large meal. That's Yeah, so about 9 a.m., they put him up there. Golgotha is place of the skull. Uh, when I first went to Israel when I was in high school, we stayed at the northern side of the old city, in an old hotel called Pilgrim's Palace. Here's a nice name for you. <clears throat> and, but right outside my window in Pilgrim's Palace, there was a, there was a big uh, parking lot kind of. Well, not really big, actually. a small parking lot. About the size of the parking lot over here in front of City Hall. There's a parking lot. And then behind it was a hillside. Well, the parking lot was actually a bus station in northern Jerusalem. <clears throat> it was a bus station. So there's always bus fumes coming in my window when I was there. <clears throat> it was bad. And, but then the hillside behind it, which is mostly just exposed limestone, looks like a skull. And uh, so if you ever go to Israel, go look there. It's right, right outside the Damascus Gate, the northern side of the old city of Jerusalem. Now, I don't know whether that was really the place where they crucified him, but it is kind of eerie because when you look out and you see that, you go, oh, whoa. Anyway, it was called the place of the skull, and that's where they led him to. And the story goes on. Matthew, Matthew picks up in 2737, and over his head they put a charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews, and then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and then one on the left. So here we have a typical thing that would happen. The reason they would put the charges above the name is because the crucifixion was meant to be a, a billboard of threat to visitors that were coming in and out of town. And there are a lot of people in town during the Passover week. And so as they would come into town on a prominent route, you would see people crucified. They would deliberately put crucified people along the route. Um, and so that's what they would do in order to warn people that while you're in town... Be nice, okay, or else this will happen to you. And so to find out how I need to be nice, they would put the crime above the name. Well, this person was a robber, or this person was a murderer, or this person just caused a riot. You could get killed from the Romans for that. Or this person is the king of the Jews. <laughs> so don't you dare come into town claiming to be the king of Jews. So this is the way that they would kind of make order happen in Rome. You would take the crucified people, put them in a prominent place, and so this would tell you, just behave yourself. Well, the narrative goes on. Matthew says in 2739, those who passed by, these are the tourists, these are the people coming into town, these are usually people out of town, those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, well, save yourself. Well, it's interesting that in their derision, they're actually testifying to what Jesus claimed to say. Although he didn't say he'd rebuild the temple, he said he'd rebuild this temple, meaning his body. So they misinterpreted, but they're quoting what they actually heard. His, his detractors are quoting what he said. They're actually caused, actually to, um, what do you want to call, further what he said. And then they said, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Because if you're the son of God, you can just come down. So they caught the fact that he claimed to be the Son of God. And they're testifying to it right here. Come down off the cross. Matthew 27, 41. Also in that crowd are chief priests with the scribes and the elders, and they mocked him. Now these are his chief detractors, his chief enemies are saying to him, neener, 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 which in Aramaic sounds like this. He saved others, but he can't save himself. So they're testifying to the fact that he saved others. 
And he did. In fact, it was only previous that he'd raised Lazarus from the dead. And we're not talking previous in terms of years or months. We're talking days, days before this. He raised Lazarus. He saved others. Doesn't seem to be able to save himself. Another one says, he's the king of Israel. Well, let him come down now from the cross. And then we'll believe in him. So there you go. Do it, Jesus. Claims to be the son of God. Claims to be the king of Israel. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. And if he, desire, if he desires him, that is, if God wants to, he'll deliver you. For he said, I'm the son of God. And this is actually probably the worst attraction he could say. You know, if you are the son of God, that means the father loves you and he'll bring you down. If he really does like you, he'll bring you down. But the fact that he's not letting you come down, he doesn't really desire it. He doesn't really like you. Oh. The amazing thing to me in all of these derisions is the fact that Jesus doesn't just blink his eyes and dissolve the people in front of him. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a, it's a tremendous amount of restraint because all through these detractions, we have no record that Jesus said a word. Not a word. And everyone's watching Jesus' reactions to these detractions. And he's not saying a word. Matthew 27, 44. And the robbers who were crucified with him, they also reviled him in the same way. Now, we forget about this. Both robbers were doing this, according to Matthew. Both of them. They were joining in the entire thing. They were both shouting stuff at Jesus as well, saying, oh, there was no one on his side in this entire crowd on the top of the hill, save Mary, his mother, and some others who were trying to get close, but from the detractors, and the people going, neener, neener, told you so, all those people... There's no one around, even the robbers themselves, both of them, robbers, both of them were doing this. But something changes, and this is what I want us to dwell on today. Something changes from this moment in the story to what happens next in the narratives. So I do my little time thing, and we go forward in time. We don't know how long, uh, not probably measured in an hour or so. Luke 23, 39, one of the criminals who were hanged, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. You claim to be the Messiah. Why aren't you saving us? Why aren't you taking us with you? But the other robber rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And he goes on, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. I mean, we deserve to be here. However, this guy, this man has done nothing wrong. What happened? Because not too long ago, that guy on the left was hurling abuses at Jesus as well. Something changed. And I'm going to ask you in a few minutes what you think changed. Well, we've got to think, yes. <laughs> but I just ate a big meal. That's okay. What changed? And then this conversation goes on. And the guy on the left says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replies, this is the only thing we hear him say on the cross. Truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today. Before Jesus himself rises from the tomb, the robber's going to have life with Jesus. That's what I mean, the resurrection. Before the resurrection. Because there's a life right after that in death. I want to focus on this. We're going to stop right here because this is a remarkable two, two statements right here. And we need to look at them more closely because we almost never do. We never look at these on Palm Sunday. We never look at them on Good Friday. We almost never look at them on Easter. But it's a remarkable statement that goes on right there. And what you're seeing actually is belief. John says to Nicodemus when he comes in the dark of night, 318, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. It seems like with Jesus and Nicodemus, the only issue is Jesus saying, do you believe who I am? That's the big deal. And then later on in John, John tells you why he writes the entire gospel, John 20, 31. But these that I've written are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Belief is everything. So for a second, we need to sort of define what belief is, especially from the Greek word they use, because it's an interesting problem in the English translation. <clears throat> you see, he uses the word believe. In all of these, believe is a verb. I'm using a little grammar tutorial here. Believing is a verb. You, you believe. You believe. That's a verb. 
But that word in Greek is just the verb version of the word for faith. So for instance, if I said faith, and I've often defined faith as having a, a confident expectation of the fulfillment of God's promises toward you. That's faith because of who God is. I have faith that what he's promised and where he's bringing me is good. I, I, I can expect that, you know. It's a confident expectation. So if I was going to ask you in English, okay, that's what faith is. That's the thing that gives you an assurance that you can't see. What is the verb version of faith? Yeah, I just came faithing today. No, that we don't, in English, we don't have a verb version of faith. We just have a noun version. But in Greek, the verb version of faith is this word believe. So basically, you, when you have faith, it's pistis. When you are believing, it's, it, it's, an, it's a, the verbal version of pistueo is what it is. So it's, it's faithing. It's faithing. So actually, whenever you see the word believe in a verb form, like you see right in these two spots, what they're doing is they're faithing. <laughs> It's a, it's a verb. It's an action. So that's why I say that believe is actually the action of faith. But believe sounds like to us the same as, as faith or, or comprehending or something like that. But it's not. It's actually saying faith is, is primarily a confident expectation. It's being persuaded that something is true. It actually comes out of the courtroom where you gather enough information and then you say, I can't see what I'm supposed to see, but I'm persuaded based on what I can see that this is what happened. So that's faith. That's pistis, right? Well, it turns out that when you act on what you know, now you're believing. So the word believe, I think, is a poor English translation. Some, it's like I, when I read the word believe in the verb here, I always put in my head faithing, faithing. And when you're faithing, when you're faithing, what you're doing is you're taking what you've been persuaded, that's the faith, and you're acting on it. And in this particular case, and all through the New Testament, that action is to take that truth, be persuaded by that truth, but your confidence in what you can't see is going to happen, and then you act based on that confidence of what's going to happen. That's faithing. That's believe. See, believe's a bad English translation. I just, it's sad to me. That's believe, the action of faith. So, in this case, I want us to just look at his statement for a second. It's not even a sentence, quite. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So this is where I want you to turn on your thinking caps, put on your thinking caps. And well, let's look at this for a second. What is it, what is it that he came to be persuaded about? Because that's the basis of faith. What was he persuaded about who Jesus is? What do you see in this? I'll just let you call him out. He's a Messiah, okay. What else is he persuaded about? That suddenly he's had this aha while he's on the cross. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Dorothy had mentioned there's a kingdom coming, which, which means he's the king. What? <laughs> How can they be killing king? Now, you know, it turns out he got this idea that Jesus was a king based on what was written over his head. <laughs> and he could have read that when they were being crucified, but he might have thought that was just a political statement. You know, oh, king of the Jews, sure, right? But now he's come to actually believe. He has faith. He's been persuaded that this is the king. What, let's dwell on that king for a second. If he is the king and there's a kingdom, when is it coming? No one knows. Oh, look at the sentence closely. You're right. Exactly. No one really exactly knows. Yeah, it's like immediately. The kingdom's already there. But he says, when you come into your kingdom. Well, wait a second. He's on the cross dying. He's got minutes left. Well, how's he going to establish a kingdom in Israel? Where's that kingdom going to come from? Well, clearly, somehow he's become persuaded of the fact that Jesus is a king, that he has a kingdom, and that there's going to be a fullness of his sovereignty in that kingdom in just a few minutes. But it's not going to be on the cross. It's going to be after death. That, I mean, that's, come on, that's a huge leap for this guy to make. That's a huge leap to make. What else do you see in here? What about the fact that he asks this? What, do you, what, what is it about that that he has been persuaded about? True. That is true. Okay, he is, he is persuaded it's true. Would you have the gall to say to Jesus, the king of this new kingdom, remember me? Remember me? I'm a criminal! <laughs> 
You see, the, you see the, how weird this is? Hey, remember me. Okay, so I was a pretty bad guy, and uh, I might have done some horrible things, and I'm being crucified because of that. But uh, can you put a good word for me when you come into your kingdom? Well, no, you're a robber. But that does not happen. See, that conflict is there right in front of your face, and you almost can't see it. What audacity to ask the king of all kings who's coming into his sovereign glory in minutes to somehow put in a good word for him when he's just a criminal. That's just crazy talk. That's crazy talk. Yeah. He calls him by name. He calls him by Jesus, name. Which we know that is, is Yeshua, Joshua. Yeshua is God Jesus saves. Hebrew. God saves, yes. His name Jesus in Hebrew Actually, Aramaic is Yeshua, which means God saves. It's the same word as Joshua from the Old Testament, which means God saves. Yehoshua. So, so he says his name, you who save, will you basically save me when you come into the fullness of your kingdom? Now, see, he would not have been joining the crowd of detractors minutes ago had he believed what he was saying right here. So somewhere between that and this, he has come to change his entire thinking about who this guy in the middle is. I mean, that's, that's a marvelous mystery for us to noodle on for a while. And we'll get to that at the very end. Because what is it that he saw and heard from his perch on top of the other cross that caused him to completely change his thinking about who Jesus was before he died. That's the amazingness of this story. Yeah, Doug. Remember, though, he's in the presence of God. He's as close as he's ever going to get. He's as close as he's ever going to get to God. Yeah, and I think it's going to play a gigantic deal. A gigantic deal. And many times we look at the cross situation and say there's really no action going on. <clears throat> However, I already showed you a bunch of action from the ground of the detractors. So we're going to factor that in in a second as well as, 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 well as how Jesus reacts. Yeah, Vidri. Nobody will come into my kingdom unless he's reborn. Ooh, no one comes into my kingdom unless he's reborn. Yeah, in fact, he doesn't say reborn here, but he does understand, and this is really a fascinating thing, that his key to joining the kingdom with Jesus has nothing to do with what he's going to accomplish because he's sort of out of time for that. But it has everything to do with Jesus putting in a word for him. His, his eternal fate has everything to do with what Jesus will do for him and nothing that he'll do for himself. And in fact, after all, <clears throat> the thief on the cross is a really bad economic gamble for God because what is this guy going to do to contribute to the kingdom of God before he dies? Zero. And yet, somehow he knows that he's being invited to this kingdom and somehow he knows there's a future beyond death. You gonna say, Michael? Yeah, Jesus didn't necessarily enter Jerusalem silently either. He didn't come in silently. That's right. The entire city knows what's going on. That's right. So he must have seen that, understood the accolations about the fact that Jesus was the king coming. Maybe he is the king. I think, I think in my mind, there, there was no problem with the fact that people knew he was sort of a king. I mean, it's on the sign. And they, and they walked in a week earlier with saying that. And that he was even the Savior. But still, still, even though he knows that, now he knows that. See the difference? For instance, the thief on the other side, he believes that Jesus exists because <laughs> he's right next to him. Many times I get into these silly conversations. Well, all I have to do is just believe that Jesus exists when it says believe in Jesus. No, that's not what we say. When we mean believe, that's not what we're saying when we say believe. It's the action from faith of being persuaded. Of, it's an action of trust and, and committing and that kind of stuff. Anyway, the guy on the other side is as exposed to who this Messiah is as the other guy is. And yet that's one of the interesting things about this entire scene is that the guy that's on the right side of the picture has even said, if you are the Messiah, then get us down from here. Does he believe that Jesus is the Messiah? No. But he knows the claims about Messiah. And that's what you find in culture in general, there's people who say, well, I know he was a real person, and I know what, who he claimed to be, but I don't really believe that. But then there are other people that do believe that and then take action. So that's the difference. Okay, we'll leave that for a second. Let's look at what Jesus replied to him, because I think this is just as fascinating. Just as fascinating. So truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. How soon? Today. Jesus and the thief are both dying 
today. So that is a, that's another affirmation of the fact that the kingdom is very near. Uh, it's, I mean, in, in terms of its fullness, very near. What do you make of the fact of this paradise thing? It's a big issue of, of contention with people. Paradise. Paradise. Well, just to put you out of your misery, I did a little research. Where, where is this word used other places? So we can kind of get a, an idea what it, how it's used in the Bible. And, uh, and these are the only places. Um, it actually comes, it's a, it's a Persian word, it turns out. And the Persian word actually sounds like paradise in English. And then that word in Persian was transliterated into Hebrew. It's used in the Old Testament. In the Hebrew, it sounds like the word paradise. I mean, they're all transliterated. And then in the Greek, it sounds like paradise. You could go into any of those cultures and say the word paradise, and they know what you're talking about. So it actually came from a Persian idea where the Persians were famous for making these well-sculpted gardens, these lovable places to go outside that are lush and green and manicured. I mean, just beautiful places to be outside. And those were the Persian paradise. It's like the best place you can think of to be outside. There's soft sun. There's tree from, shade from large trees. There's flowers along the edges. There's a babbling brook. There's little bunnies hopping between... Okay, maybe not the bunnies, but, but there's a, the whole idea about this wonderful outdoor space. <clears throat> in other kind of inept English uh, translations, they use the word park for paradise. It's like a park. No, not like my parks. It's much nicer than that, okay? But in the, in the Old Testament, you see it in Ecclesiastes 2.5, and you'll see it. And when he's talking about a wonderful place, it's like a paradise. A pardis is how you say it in Hebrew. It's a pardis. Yeah, in Ecclesiastes. Go read it. It's really fascinating. And then in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul's talking about, well, there's a guy, not saying who, who got caught up into the third heaven, not saying who, you know. You know that passage I'm talking about? And as he's talking about that, he also talks, he, he mentions the fact that in this entire vision, he's, he's actually in the presence of a pardis, of a paradise. It's like I'm in this fantastically beautiful place. Oh, and then when you get to Revelation, now Revelation 2 is in the middle of the letters. There's seven letters to seven churches in the front of Revelation. <clears throat> and when he's writing to the church in Ephesus, he says basically to them at the end of his letter, you know, if you hold on, if you get to the end, you know, if you do things right, then you'll find yourself, you'll find yourself eating from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That's what you're going to see, he says. So there you've got this Eden-like paradise, even at the end of Revelation, where you're talking about being in a wonderful place. So the word paradise, as the, as the thief on the cross is hearing it, all he's hearing is a wonderfully pleasant place. That's, Jesus is saying, this might be really bad right now, but today you'll be with me in a gorgeously wonderful, lush place. I mean, you can't even imagine a nicer place to be. And then he puts a, a phrase on it that is, just blows me away. He doesn't just say you'll be in paradise today. He says you'll be with me in paradise today. And that is the quintessential, defining, bold, wonderful thing about heaven is you'll be with him. And, you know, I get, I get questions from time to time to people, what's heaven going to be like? And I say, well, I can give you a couple of small things, but I can tell you the one thing that I'm so thrilled about is that he's going to be there. So in a sense, I don't really care about the rest of it, although I do sort of. But you know what? If that's where Jesus is, I'm in. That's where I want to be. That's what I want to talk about. Let's talk about whether you're actually looking forward to his appearing to where you're going to be with him. And so when he talks to the thief on the cross, he says, don't worry. I will put in a good word for you in the kingdom and you will be with me in a wonderful place. That's all he's saying. You'll be with me in a wonderful place. It's amazing he's saying this to a convicted criminal. Okay, what else do you notice in this phrase before we leave it? Because this is, this is an astonishingly compact little nugget of truth. Jesus is taking care of the problem of the fact that he's talking to a criminal who clearly, publicly, is a sinner. And yet he's going to be with the Holy One. Yeah, that's a good one. But, but I'll add on what I was trying to add to what you were saying um, some people have noticed this before. How can he be in heaven with his sins paid for if Jesus hasn't died yet? Anyone have a problem with that? Well, it's interesting because what Jesus did on the cross for us works forward in time for us, and it works backward in time for those who come to understand who he is before that. 
even if they don't know the name of the Messiah, if they understand based on the Old Testament that there is one that's given on their behalf who will die on their behalf to pay for the wrath of their sins. So in a, in a real sense, what Jesus does on the cross is not as constrained by time as we like to think that it is. It has effects forward and backward in time. And so even though it hasn't happened yet, it's still going to work for the guy on the cross before the resurrection happens. But for those of us who have kind of analytic minds, this is just wrong. It's out of sequence. He should have said, if I was writing the Bible, he should have said, don't worry, Mr. Criminal, you'll be with me in paradise after I raise from the dead in two or three days. Just hold on to your horse, we'll get there. <laughs> right? Doesn't that make more sense? Come on, that makes more sense. But he says, nope, today. Today. Yeah, Doug. He personalized, don't you love it? Like, I just love that. Because he, he's assuring him when he says truly. He says, look, I am telling you the truth. I am telling you the truth. It's very personal. It's very, he doesn't just give some, some wild theological statement. He says, I am telling you, and I'm telling you truthfully, you, listen, today, with me, great place. <sighs> and, and that's what's fascinating about the other thief. I mean, he is seeing the same things the other thief is seeing, but he hasn't accepted it. He knows that Jesus is real. He's right next to him. He knows the claims about him, but he's not buying into him. He taunts him and says, if, if you are who they say you are, then get us off these crosses. He's not believing anything. He's not believing anything. It just fascinates me. So I'm gonna, we're going to wrap this up. I'll, I'll do a couple of, a, a list that I made as I was thinking about, as I was thinking through, just these very simple statements. <clears throat> Again, believing that's the action of faith. If faith has no resultant actions, it's probably not faith. And that's what the writer James says in his book. He says, there's no good works. There's nothing coming out of your faith. And I would propose you don't have real faith because faith ought to always move itself into an action perspective. Either that's trusting or putting your, putting your uh, hopes and dreams in what he promises for you. It, it should change the whole orientation of your life that faith. If it doesn't, then you're just believing in intellectual things. So this believing is action. Now, what, did the, what are the actions that the thief took on the cross? He said, you're the king. I mean, he was persuaded. That's what faith means. And then he said it. He confessed it. You're the king. You're the king. And he also says, <laughs> says basically, <laughs> by what he doesn't say, I got nothing to offer here. I got nothing to offer your kingdom. I'm, I'm just about used up. I'm minutes away from my life. There's nothing I'm going to do to contribute to your kingdom except, well, there's just me. There's just me. I, I really like this because the bar for coming into God's kingdom has very little to do with what you accomplish between now and the time you die. In fact, it has nothing to do with what you accomplish because the thief on the cross, there's nothing he's going to do for Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, you'll be in my kingdom in a few minutes, and because of that, will you spend the rest of your life going on crusades across all of the Mediterranean and telling people about who I am, blah, 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 and being useful to me, and then when you stop being useful to me, then you know, you'll come to, to me in heaven and everything will be done. No, he, there's no expectation he's going to accomplish anything at all. Now, that, that rubs against us because our thinking is that it's what we do for God that earns our place with God. I mean, that's a common thought. That's reinforced by almost every other social structure that we live in. If you're in school, you get a grade that's, you know, proportional to the work you put into it. You get pay on a job, usually proportional to the work you put into it. I mean, it just seems to go, you know, one follows the other. And yet in God's kingdom, he's very clear to make clear all the way through the Old Testament from Genesis to Revelation that what God says to us is, it's not what you do for me, it's what I do for you that changes the equation. And remember, the thief on the cross got that. Will you remember me? Will you do something on my behalf? Because I'm clearly out of gas. That's hard for it. As a result of that, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of debate that comes up when you see the paradise work. Because people will say, well, he's not going to do anything. But you know what? He's not getting to the full place. He's just getting to the paradise place. He's not getting to the, the, the big guacamole, you know, heaven in the sky thing. He's not getting to that. Because you can't unless you've got all these other things to line up behind your compass list. He's not getting to that. He's just getting to paradise. Well, what's paradise? Well, that's kind of a heaven minus. 
And from that point, usually the definitions get to be very non-biblical because it's, it's just, it's hard to believe that, that just by making this assertion on the cross, you can grab the brass ring on the merry-go-round and you can go to heaven. I mean, it just, it just, is that it? It clearly can't be it. So paradise must not be heaven. It must be something lesser. Well, I got to tell you, you look at that word paradise, and especially when you look at Revelation, it's heaven, especially the Revelation passage. It's heaven. So <clears throat> he basically is saying, I got nothing to offer to you. And he also, and he said this just before that last one, he says, I, I deserve the justice that's coming to me. I've sinned, man. I've sinned. This is his public confession, not only to the other thief, but to Jesus himself. I'm here because I did wrong, and I admit that. You don't hear the other thief ever say that. He never really fesses up to that. In fact, you know, in some years I was doing jail ministry, almost every time I talk to a guy in jail, and we talk, and this is private, we talk about how's life going and what's going on, and one of the things you cannot do in jail is ask them why they're in jail. You don't, you don't ask them that. I learned that really early on. So, what are you here for? What'd you do? You don't do that. So just if you go, you don't do that. Because... Almost every one of them will say, I'm here on a bum rap. Well, didn't you break the law? And sometimes they say, well, yeah, but you know what? <sighs> I'm in desperate times right now, you know? Sometimes you got to steal a car just to stay alive uh, because I don't have any other income. So, you know, it's the, it's the culture. It's the society that's doing this to me. I don't like stealing cars, but I had to because I can't eat if I don't. So there. Didn't you break the law? Well, yeah, but I had to. Okay, so <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But it, there, there's actually no confession of sin right there. There's no way of saying, yeah, man, that was stupid. That was wrong. We can't have this in society. I shouldn't have done it. You don't see that. It's more like a justification that even though it's technically against the law, well, sure, I shivved him with a knife. But you know what? He was pushing me. <laughs> you, know, you know what? We giggle because we do this all the time when people talk about our sin. So just back off before you laugh at them. He clearly said to Jesus, I deserve this justice. Now in, in, the, in the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus starts off by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. This is poor in spirit right here. It's an admission to God that I got nothing. I bring nothing to you. I earn nothing to impress you. I don't come from any place that says I got anything that brings me any kind of reason to think that you'll love me. I got nothing. Poor in spirit literally translates the beggars in spirit, the ones who sit on the street begging because they got nothing. But theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he realizes that Jesus knows him. There's, some, there's something in the conversation and it's back to what you were saying, Doug, this, this personal connection. Tilly, I say to you, I say to you, I know who you are. That I, I know everything about you. There's something in the conversation that, that seems to be there, but it's unspoken. I know everything about you. Still, today, I'll put in a good word for you, and we're there. That's, that's amazing. Because if, he, if the thief believes that Jesus is not only the king of kings and the king of a coming kingdom in its fullness... He also believes that he's the Messiah. And if he's the Messiah, then he's all-powerful and he's all-knowing. And if that's the case, then if he's that guy, if he's that guy from the Old Testament, and he's looking at me, he should know that I don't qualify for his kingdom. I mean, it says it just surely because of the nails in my hands. I don't deserve your kingdom. And yet still, still Jesus loves him anyway. And you see it in the tone of his voice. He doesn't chase him away. In fact, he invites him to the kingdom. He doesn't laugh when the guy says, remember me. He doesn't, you know, like I would say, remember me when you come to your kingdom. Oh, yeah, right, like that's going to happen. I wouldn't be a Christian if that's what Jesus said. He said, today. And somehow he knows that Jesus can make a way for him. He understands who he is. He understands his shortcomings. He understands that even though he can do some good things in his life, that largely he's full of bad things he does in his life. There's no going back on those. That's my history. That's who I am. 
This is who I am, Jesus. I got nothing. And yet still, despite the burden of that sin, he understands that Jesus and Jesus alone can do something for him in the next life. And he admits that this, his kingdom is not of this world. Remember, he, Jesus said that deliberately right to, to, to Pontius Pilate. Because he asked him, he said, look, the crowd's out there saying that you're a king of the Jews. You're a king. Are you a king? And he says, well, <clears throat> my kingdom's not of this world. If it was of this world, look, my followers, and there's lots of them, would be out there fighting for me, right? They'd be fighting for me, but they're not. Because my kingdom's not of this world. And that's what we're talking about here in the next minutes as they come to die. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. And, and this, this, this guy knows this. He's, the thief is not banking on the fact that somehow he's going to get taken off the cross. Jesus is going to hop down off the cross. They're going to overthrow the Romans and everything's going to happen. He's going to come into his kingdom. He's going to finally march into the temple and everything's going to be turned upside down like everyone expected about a week earlier. He's not expecting that at all. He's just saying, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Wow. And clearly Jesus invites him to be with him. He invites us to be with him. He wants us to be part of the kingdom and, and not just be in a place with streets of gold. <laughs> the determination here that thrills our hearts is we will be with him. We will be with him. You know, we talked about this a while ago in Hebrews about, uh, and earlier in another book, where, where Paul, Paul and the writer of Hebrews both are saying there's something about a believer whose heart leaps a little bit when you think about being with him. I mean, so many scenes in the New Testament I read, and I go, man, what I would have been given to have been born 2,000 years earlier and been in the midst of that. I would have loved to have seen that. I would have loved to have been that close to Jesus. I would have loved to see that going on, be right there. Oh, it'd be great. What it would be like to be with him. Well, he says to the thief, today you'll be with me. That thrills my heart. He invites us to be with him. And Jesus welcomes us immediately after death. Today you'll be with me in paradise. That's why a lot of people ask me, what happens when you die? Where do you go? Uh, and if Jesus is coming back and say it's a thousand years from, from now, well, where are you between now and then? Well, I can't answer that really well because the Bible can't, doesn't answer that really well. However, this passage right here tells me, at least from the thief's perspective and the thief's conscious experience, he'll die and then immediately he'll be with Jesus. I mean, that's what it's saying. It's, it's very hard to get around that. Today, you'll be with me in this great place. Today, you'll be with me. Well, what about the fact that Jesus isn't coming, say, for another 2,000 years? How does that work? Well, I can't give you a great answer on that. All I know, and this is what thrills my heart, is that when I close my eyes and I breathe my last, I'll be with them. And you know, even if I can't describe the mechanics of between here and there, that's like, you know, that's enough for me. That satisfies my soul. And I think for the thief on the cross, that satisfied his soul. You'll be with me today. Oh, okay. This is a picture that Tiso did of the view from the cross, looking down. This is a view from Jesus' perspective, looking down. And for years, I've seen this picture and spotted people and things in it. Like, for instance, in the middle right there, you see that square hole? That's the grave. That's the tomb. And if you go to the Holy Sepulchre Church, where they say that all these events happened, inside that church is not only the carved out piece of rock that has that square opening, but just steps away is another part inside of it where it's the mounded hill where the cross was. It's, it's in there, too. And they're this close together. <laughs> which is why Tiso drew it this way. I mean, you're, you're actually on the cross from this perspective, and you take maybe 20 or 30 steps toward that grave, and that's where the tomb is. It's like, like right there. But as I analyzed this and picked out people over the years, you can tell his detractors, and you can tell the ones that loved him. Because as you go down in this picture, and you look further down to the actual place where the cross is put in the ground, you see people you recognize, not because you recognize them, but you know they're there. I mean, there's Jesus' mother, the other Marys. Who's this? John the Apostle, because he was the only one we know that got close at the end. And uh, at the very bottom of Tiso's picture, 
Uh, he's got this other woman. Not sure who she is. She could be one of there's several options for who she is. But you know what I'd missed for years looking at this picture until this week? At the very center bottom of the picture, what do you see? The feet of Jesus. I didn't catch that until this week. I'm slow. Sorry. But I bring this picture up because this is not only what Jesus saw during the crucifixion. This is what the two thieves saw during the crucifixion. And you can look in the faces of those people that are there and you can start to understand who Jesus is based on them. Now, there's people in that crowd that we saw before who were detractors, who were saying these nasty things. Prove yourself to be who you say you are. Come down from the cross. They had no concept that the cross wasn't a train wreck. It was, it was a conscious plan on God's part. It was deliberate. It was voluntary. So yes, Jesus could have come down. And they said, come down. Wouldn't anybody in the cross come down? If you say who you are, who you are, then do it. Who would stay on a cross? Clearly not understanding that the price had to be paid for sin. That, that he stayed on the cross by the power of God, not by the powerlessness of God. He stayed on the cross. And I think as the thieves watched the people in that crowd around him, and they watched Jesus' reaction when they would say these horrible things about him, and they wouldn't hear Jesus have a snappy comeback to what they said, when they saw him absorb those detractions, and, and when, when he didn't debate them, he didn't say, well, I never said I was the son of God. He doesn't say that. I never said I'd do this. Well, he doesn't say that. He's, it seems as though from our, the narrative we have, he was silent from all that stuff. And when he sees the love coming from all these people, from people of, again, bad backgrounds, Mary Magdalene. I mean, you've got some people of kind of questionable morality right there at the foot of the cross. And when the thief is looking at those people, and he's looking at their reaction and their love for Jesus. And he's looking how Jesus handles his detractors. He comes to the same conclusion that a Roman centurion comes to just hours later. And he says, this has to be the Son of God. Because of what he saw right here. That's just got to be the case. And he puts two and two together. And he says, this guy is the Son of God. And if he is the Son of God, he's the Messiah. And if he's the Messiah, then he has a promised reign as a king, and his kingdom hasn't come yet, but it is coming. So he is the guy. He places his trust. That's the action of faith and persuasion. He puts his trust in Jesus. And he says, when you get there, can I come? And Jesus says, yes. Today. Today. You're there. That's why the thief changed. I'm convinced of it. <laughs> I'm convinced of it. It's the people in this picture that convinced him. Now let me a little, put a little PS about that. For many of you who are believers in Jesus, your actions in the midst of trauma like this is what brings people to an understanding of who Jesus is. Just saying. And for those of you who may not know Jesus, don't believe in who he is, what the thief did is as simple as it is. You know, to admit <laughs> that you're a sinner and to confess that you're a sinner and you're full of problems. There's nothing in me that merits God's love for me and yet still I recognize he does love me. And you place yourself, faith takes action and you place yourself in his hands. I trust you for my future. And then Jesus says, oh, okay. <coughs> you're in because of what I've done for you. It really is that simple. It really is that simple. That's why he emphasizes Nicodemus in that dark meeting. It's all about who you think I am. Do you believe who I am? Do you believe that I'm the Messiah? I, are you willing to act on the fact of who I am? Are you persuaded about who I am? Because if you are, take some steps and be saved. Call out, Joel, Joel. The prophet Joel says, all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And Paul echoes this in Romans. All. Including a thief on a cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this story. We thank you that you gave Luke the opportunity to capture it for us when the others didn't. And Lord, we are, uh, we continue to be moved by the simplicity of the interaction. 
And Lord, I am impressed again at the patience of Jesus in the midst of all these detractions and shouting and lack of faith, lack of belief in who he is. These taunts that are meant to hurt. And yet he holds his place. He is not deterred. He doesn't come down from the cross. But he persists because it was a plan from the beginning of the universe that you would come in the flesh and you'd die on our behalf that we might be able to join your kingdom, to be with you, to be with you in the face of all of our sins. What an astonishing thing. And Lord, I don't know if this would happen, but I would look forward to meeting this thief someday and ask for from some more details. I mean, what was it like that day? What really changed your mind? What did you see that caused you to do an about face about this guy between you and the other robber? I would love to know more. But God, you give us enough for me to be amazed and to be amazed for the rest of eternity that this would happen. And this would happen in such a public way in front of not only his followers, but all of his enemies. Just astonishing. So Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you that you rose on our behalf. We thank you that we can say, remember me. And you say, okay, I've made a way. You are so beautiful to us because of that. And because of that, we raise up your name today. You are the beautiful one. You are the one who saves. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.